and I asked him if he could teach me how to spin yarn. And he said, yes, young man, no problem. Come over here, sit down, take a breath, like take your time, get ready to learn something that's going to change your life. And it totally has. Hi, I am Sophie. I'm an activator of community for the planet. And with Mapis à l'oreille, I share vision, ideas, experiences to bring people together and take better care for the planet. And I also meet inspiring people to talk about their dreams and passions and how to make the world a better place. And today I am with Marnix, who has an inspiring passion and since his very young age, and I wanted to give him an opportunity to share his passion with the world. So welcome Marnix to this show. And I'm excited to hear more about your stories and, uh, sh and hear stories that I don't know already and, <laughs> and to, <laughs> to hear about what you have to share. So can you tell me what's your passion? What? Well, thank you for having me, Sophie. My passion is spinning yarn. So I like taking natural fibers and twisting them up to make yarn that can be used for all kinds of different fiber applications. And so how did you come to do that? So I've been spinning for a long time. Even though I'm only 23, I've been spinning for 15 years. Cool. So I started spinning when I uh, went to a Native American reservation oh, yeah? with my mom. So that was in a dad. reservation? So in a reservation at a Pueblo in New Mexico, we came across this guy who was sitting uh, like on a little tiny step stool, working super hard, super focused. And what he was doing was making yarn on a traditional Navajo spindle, which is a really long uh, pole with a little flywheel on it and they, they roll it along their legs and that's how they twist up the yarn mm. to uh, make yarn. And so, so you saw that guy and what happened? Well, uh, I was, was young and wanted to explore the world and learn everything in front of me. So I uh, asked him if he could teach me how to spin yarn. And he said, yes, young man, no problem. Come over here, sit down take a breath, like take your time, get ready to learn something that's going to change your life. And really? it totally has. Wow. You were just eight years old. Yeah, just had, eight years old. And you had this like longing to learn that, that yeah. you just saw. So what happened next? So next, that very same day, I told my parents, guys, I want to do this forever. This guy is so cool. This hobby is so cool. Look how beautiful these fibers are. Look at these little sheep running around the farm. Uh, we could totally do something with all this wool that we have all around us here in New Mexico and that we see and wear every day. So I asked my parents to take me to go get my own spindle and my parents were like, all right, buddy, but you don't get all the fancy machines right away. Like you're probably going to give up on this hobby after two weeks like you do with the rest of them. Uh, and uh, then they took me to buy so we bought one small navajo spindle for like 20 bucks and then we bought a whole bunch of beautiful fiber because when we got to the yarn store or the fiber store um my parents were also like really excited by the beauty of the fibers and the potential that you see whenever you hold like a sheep's fleece mm -hmm. just the art that it could become Mm. So your family was really supportive of you starting this hobby and, uh, and doing all that. So yeah. what did you start making? So I began by just making more and more yarn. So I would uh, work with the Navajo spindle because that's what I had learned on. And uh, I began making little samples of yarn like this one here. Yeah, we could show in the camera. Amazing. So this is a couple of different types of wool and sheep. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, so this is actually a combination of two different specialty fibers. It's a combination of Coradale wool from a Coradale sheep and flax from the same plant that they make linen out of. Wow, it's yeah. amazing. So where do you get the materials? How did you get the materials? Did you get it from these farms, from the yeah, reservation? So I, 
have gotten them in all kinds of different places. I've gotten them from farms. I've harvested them myself. What I used to do at my one of our houses in the Netherlands is take stinging nettles and cut them down and soak them in water for like eight or ten days. Wow. Or maybe even longer until all the plant material started to rot away and all that was left was the stringy fibers wow. and I could spin those together and luckily stinging nettles don't sting after oh, cool. all the plant material yeah. is gone. Wow, so you made it yourself, that's impressive and uh, you harvested it also on the ship? On the yeah, sheep? so I've so I went to like sheep shearing festivals as an eight-year-old they didn't let me shear the sheep with the big scissors myself oh, yeah. but we would go to like the rodeo in Denver because wow. uh, we had already lived here so we would go to the rodeo and pick up sheep fleeces there wow. and uh, all kinds of different places but my favorite shop to go to whenever I had the money because I saved up all my allowances to uh, buy more material to spin with mm. my favorite store was Fancy Tiger in Denver Colorado what is it Fancy Tiger is a yarn shop oh. that has moved away from spinning but at the time they had a huge attic upstairs at their old location. Now they have a new location on South Broadway um, where they have less fiber, but I was just amazed to see the walls and walls of different colored and different types of fiber. So what did you make with the, the yarn you were making? Well, so in the beginning, I didn't really make anything. What I made is called skeins, which are big loops of yarn like this. Wow. So I uh, pretty much found that well there was so much that you could do with the yarn, spinning is my true hobby. Mm -hmm. So I made the yarn and then at some point I wanted to begin doing some more stuff with it. So I began uh, learning to weave. Mm -hmm. So first I made a little loom out of PVC pipe and nails. Uh, by myself in the garage to be able to have a little loom to weave all the fibers together with and my mom knew how to knit so she uh, started knitting mittens for me mm -hmm. but I always got bored of each project by the time I had enough to make one mitten so we found that you could make one mitten out of one skein and uh, that was enough so I had a whole wall of paintings in my in my hallway of single mittens because we didn't have any matching pairs because <laughs> you were bored before you yeah. were finishing doing it so so now what when you spin now if you don't knit uh so much then do you give that away to your family yeah exactly so i um have a family of other fiber artists or at least after i began making so much yarn they began using their the hobbies that they knew from when they were kids which was knitting and sewing and all that to um, to make different things so I gave it gave a lot of yarn away to my family so here's a great example of a piece that I made we can open it maybe to see. yeah it's... and it's a sweater that my grandma knit for me all out of hand spun fibers yeah, so do you want to explain the fiber that's, that are in there? Yeah, so these are two special fibers to me. Um, the white fiber is super important to me because it's from a sheep called Svea in the neighborhood of Schiedam in the Netherlands. So while I was in college, I rode my bike over to this guy's house and he introduced me to the sheep that he got the wool from and uh, and showed me how he processed all the yarn on his big carting machines. And then the yellow wool is important to me because I got it from AliExpress. Uh, so the cheapest Not the side, same origin. <laughs> not the same origin. So uh, I don't know that cheap, but I do know that I got it for a good deal, which was great while I was in college. So right. they're both important and valuable fibers to me. Yeah. So. How, how important is it for you to, to have the source of the yarn coming from a natural source or... Yeah, so now it's really important to me 
to know where the wool that I'm getting is coming from. So like knowing the sheep and knowing the farms where the plant fibers were produced is really special because the closer you are to where the wool came from, the more you can make art out of it. Mm. You feel, you think there is something uh, sacred in it or? Yeah, how? I think so. Yeah. I think you feel, that, you feel a difference when you do that. That when you're spinning that yarn and you see that sheep in front of you, um, you have a much bigger connection to the fiber. So I actually designed a ship while I was in the Netherlands that I named after the sheep Svea. Mm. Um, or uh, that's one of my favorite ships anyway, is that design for uh, a sailing yacht named after this ship. You designed a ship? Oh yeah, because you were studying architecture, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I designed a ship or found a ship in, in conjunction with one of the biggest yacht builders in the Netherlands. Wow. One of the best sailing yacht designers in the world, Vitter Shipyard. Yeah. And they have a yacht called Svea, which is the same name as wow. the sheep. Wow, that's amazing. So the ship that's and the sheep can go together sometimes. Oh, wow. That's cool. So you went back to the Netherlands. You grew up here, right? In, right. Can you tell me about your roots? Right. So I've been uh, all over the world, at least on both sides of the ocean. With uh, Originally, I was born in the Netherlands, and then I moved to the U.S. when I was six and moved back to uh, the Netherlands when I was 18 for college and then now I moved back to Colorado because this is where my roots are at now. Mm. Yeah and this is where your passion takes its roots as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you were in the Netherlands you were studying architecture and you said that you didn't finish your studies because you were so focused on that on that passion yeah right? I, I spent a lot of time spinning and not a lot of time studying yeah uh, so um, I was really engaged in all the uh, fiber arts in my community and all the artists in my community and was much closer to those than the engineers who were up in their offices acting all high and mighty I kind of found that the people I met at the wool fairs and at some different events that I went to um, with wool, like had a lot more spirit and mm -hmm. uh, made me happier and brought me closer to who I was. Wow. And so while you were there, you told me about a contest. Can you tell me more about this contest? Yeah. So there was a contest from Blue City, which is uh, Blue City is an organization in Rotterdam that organizes all kinds of eco-friendly things and they have a huge uh, eco center inside the old Tropicana Aquarium mm. in Rotterdam which is a huge like floating aquarium or has, is an aquarium with huge floating areas uh, in the river next to it and uh, at that aquarium which is an aquarium that we used to go to when we were when I was a kid oh yeah uh, just to go swimming is there's now all kinds of different eco-friendly businesses so there's uh, some like businesses that that cook really eco-friendly food and distribute that out to the community and there's gardeners and uh, beer brewers and different companies making recyclable plastics and things like that but one of the things that blue city does is host competitions for the college students in the area. So they hosted something called the Wool Hackathon to solve one of the biggest problems in the current wool industry in the Netherlands, which is that 70 to 80% of the wool in the Netherlands is thrown away and nothing is ever done with it. So wow, we needed huge. a solution. Right. Yeah. Because is the wool industry a big industry in the Netherlands? Yeah, there's a lot of sheep because sheep are great at maintaining the dunes mm -hmm, yeah like the sand dunes yeah um which is protecting the netherland from uh flooding yeah mm. yeah so sheep are great at maintaining the land and they're great farm animals in a uh whatever you call it and and a farm system where you have different types of animals to balance each other out and different mm -hmm. types of uh like seeds and farm products to keep the land balanced. 
Okay. Uh, so since sheep are such an important part of balanced agriculture in the Netherlands, uh, they're going to be there. And the sheep are already there and the wool is already there. But right now, and especially during COVID, nothing is being done with that wool. Mm -hmm. Because um, we're not just talking about enough wool to make a sweater from. We're talking about enough wool to fill up 20 entire container ships full of cargo. Mm. So you're talking a north of a million tons of wool. Mm -hmm. um, which means that, that something really needs to be done with the wool on a large scale because it uh, can't all just be shipped off to China because the cost is prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So there's different entrepreneurs trying to make different products out of traditionally true Dutch wool. Okay. And it's the same in America. Mm -hmm. In America, there's companies trying to make wool out of the sheep they know themselves and the sheep they have themselves. Cool. But the volume is just insurmountable because there's because one sheep produces 80 pounds of wool wow. and during uh you know four hours of spinning i don't even spin a half a pound wow oh yeah all right that's so that there is gigantic amount of resources for you to spin yeah so there's plenty to spin but i found that uh in during the Blue, Blue City Wool Hackathon, I found that I needed a solution that was effective on industrial scale, not mm -hmm. just creative scale. Right. So what I came up with, and the idea that eventually won the competition, was the idea that wool could be used as a, a fiber to add tensile strength to dams and dikes in the Netherlands. So by taking all that wool and not needing it to be processed and not needing it to be cleaned and none of that all you have to do is dump it on the ground and run a plow over it and mix it in with the soil to add a ton of strength to the soil so that way when you're building dams and dikes they don't require nearly as much maintenance instead of requiring full maintenance every 20 years a dam could last up to 30 40 years mm -hmm. before the wool would be fully rotten away wow. underground that's genius. And uh, do you know if they are actually going to do that? No, I think it would have been my master's thesis if I had stayed in the Netherlands. Oh, okay. I yeah. think uh, if someone was going to take it on as their idea, it's mine. So it's still my idea mm -hmm. to take into the industrial world. Wow. So it could still happen. It could still happen. Yeah. And here in Denver, we don't have nearly as many dams or dikes. Mm -hmm. But uh, across the reservoir just near here, Chatfield Reservoir, there has been dam repair and damage mm -hmm. to the dam, um, which potentially could have been alleviated or entirely overcome if wool had been used during the construction wow. of that dam. Because it's just a big pile of sand mm -hmm. with nothing in it. And what modern designers are thinking is, oh, we'll put a steel mesh through it. But then you have to pay for all that steel and put that all in there and fit it in pe puzzle piece by puzzle piece. Well, with wool, you could just mm -hmm. add it to the soil. Yeah, because it's all st string together yeah. with the wool. Yeah. Amazing story from the Netherlands, but I know there is some other amazing stories in the Netherlands that happened to you. Do you want to share some of these beautiful and amazing stories that happen with yeah. spinning? Yeah, there's been some crazy times uh, with the whole spinning hobby. Since it's been so important to me, I've always wanted to continue spinning. So while I was in elementary school and middle school, I kept spinning and then in the beginning of high school I didn't spin so much because I didn't know if, it, if I would be cool then but um, then I had a traumatic brain injury halfway through high school so I uh, needed something to do while I was at the hospital for two months wow. and my parents grabbed my spinning wheel out of the garage and brought it to Amazing. the hospital and I made it my hobby there and uh, really kept going with that hobby all the way into college. And when I moved back into the Netherlands, I wanted to continue spinning, but I didn't have a wheel because I wasn't gonna bring one of these big old spinning wheels like you see sitting behind Sophie here. Yeah, well, we can show it. Yeah. Um, I wasn't able to bring one of those all the way with me across the ocean, so I had to get a new one. And I didn't have very much money, so I was looking for a good deal. So. 
I found a deal for a spinning wheel for just 25 euros, uh, only maybe 100 miles north of me. So I had to take the train all the way up north for two or three hours, and then I took, or I took the bus from, or I took the train from Rotterdam to Amsterdam, and then I had to take a bus from Amsterdam to Alkmaar to pick up the spinning wheel. And that all went smoothly. I bought the wheel from a lady who was really into fiber arts, but had four, four or five kids, so she didn't have time to make the yarn herself. So she uh, just uh, bought it from other spinners and, and bought factory produced yarn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, I bought the wheel, that went great. And then I got on the bus home and all the bus drivers were giving me props and congratulations and everyone at the, every station was laughing at me. Um, because they all thought it was a really cool hobby and they all had seen it, but the last time they had seen a spinning wheel was in the movie Cinderella. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, then eventually I got to Amsterdam Central and I had about a 30 minute wait at the station, so no problem. I, you know, went and grabbed a croquette and, uh, sat down and chilled for a little bit, had my spinning wheel sitting next to me, and then there was an announcement over the PA system. <laughs> and they said, there has been a bomb threat. The entire station is in lockdown. Oh, wow. No one can leave. No one can come in. Trains are off. <laughs> restaurants are open. Good luck. Wow. So there was a bomb at the station. So we couldn't go into one half of the station at all and had to stay down in the station hall. Wow. Um, and uh, I realized and they made it sound like it was probably going to take three or four or five hours. And I was like, wow, what am I going to do? And everyone's around me sitting on their phones, like pfft, texting their family. I'm not going to make it home for dinner tonight. Wow. I'm like, no worries. I have a plan. <laughs> uh, and so I grabbed my spinning wheel, grabbed the wool that the lady had given me out of her inventory for me to practice with and get to know the wheel with. And I'd brought some wool to test out the wheel myself. And, uh, I began spinning at the station. I guess so a lot of people started like looking at you or talking to you. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had more pictures of me taken with or without request wow. uh, since that day. Wow. And I'm sure that everyone was texting their friends about that too because uh, <laughs> they were all pretty impressed that some guy in like, I think I was probably wearing a full suit. Oh, wow. Uh, was was sitting at the station spinning on a really old $25 wheel. Mm -hmm. So different people were impressed. Uh, some some old ladies who had spun before as kids, some children wanted to see the wheel and asked if they could touch it. And I said, yeah, but wait till it stops turning because you'll cut your hand wow, off. Wow, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, then uh, some other people came up and they weren't just anybody, they were the cops. And I was like, oh no, like, is this okay? Am I the bomb threat? What's the issue here? Were they so surprised that they saw a spinning wheel that they closed the whole station down? Oh my um, gosh. But they came up and they wanted to take pictures and like, were all totally impressed by it. And the station was full of cops because there had been a bomb threat. Right. So of course. Yeah. And every single cop oh that walked by was like, Wow, man, like, this is so cool. Like, keep it up. Uh, That's cool. And lekker bezig, they said to me. Oh. Um, and uh, th so that was really cool. And then the guy who had been sitting next to me for two hours already tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, buddy, that's pretty cool. Like, uh, you've been spinning for a long time. You're pretty good at that. And... I was like, yeah, you know, just kind of my hobby. Got to do something while I'm here. And I had a spinning wheel with me, so why the hell not? Right? And then he was like, I own a company called Joe Marino, which is the biggest producer of eco-friendly, like handmade, fully natural wool sweaters in the Netherlands. So um, Joe Marino. Wow. It's definitely a link that you can find in the description. Yeah, and there is some yarn that's made out of I mean merino wool is a thing right yeah so all so their sweaters like, are merino wool like produced in the Netherlands big it's crazy 
Yeah. Such so a coincidence that it was, it was just at the same time as that you and had the been. CEO or the I think he was the chief financial officer. Wow. So the CFO for Phew. Joe Marino. Uh, Good connection. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was uh, inspired by it, but I was so in my zone and I was totally just worried about spinning, so I didn't get his number, didn't care about it. Moved oh wow. On. Anyway, then finally they said the station was going to open again and some trains started coming in. Uh, and uh, I uh, like went upstairs and uh, met a beautiful girl at the station and she was like I go to the fiber arts school and I want to learn how to spin can you teach me how to spin so I taught her how to spin because I have a pretty good 10 minute lesson or so that can teach people how to spin just like that and she really had a knack for it and everything but then her train went and I never saw her again, and I didn't get her number because I was so in the zone <laughs> with uh, so all the spinning on business. Spinning. Uh, and uh, yeah, made it home. That, and that's amazing how how in nice. this trip to get your spinning wheel on the way back, you meet like one of the most important person in, in the business of making this beautiful yeah yeah the guy stuff, from Joe and Marino. Then a beautiful woman and it's, all this is like for me. It sounds like a confirmation that this is your path. You got to go on that path. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. yep. amazing. So then I came back to the Netherlands and made different wool. Like the wool in this was made on that spinning wheel that was uh, there during the bombing. Wow. Or luckily there wasn't actually a bomb. That's a disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was. You were fine. Yeah. You were fine. That is cool. Um, then you told me that when you were a kid, that's one of the stories you, you told me about, that you started teaching very early. You became a very young teacher. Yeah. So when I was about 10 years old, like I said, my parents had only bought me the spindles because they weren't sure I was going to keep with the hobby long enough. But I had spun on the spindles and gone spin, 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 spin uh, on different spindles, originally on the traditional Navajo spindle and then later on the more English style drop spindle, which you hold up in the air and it drops down off of the yarn. Wow, um, so you tried different styles. Yeah, so I tried all, all kinds of different spindles and I made my own out of a little plumbing flange and CDs on a dowel mm. and uh, different things like that. But eventually I was reading Spin Off Magazine, maybe another link you can find in the description. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, in spin-off magazine, I always saw them spinning on big spinning wheels. And at the yarn store, I always saw them on beautiful machines to uh, to spin the yarn. <laughs> and uh, I wanted one for myself. So I found the cheapest spinning wheel online. The, um, I forget the company, but it was called the Babe Spinning Wheel. So... It was a great spinning wheel for kids because it was made out of like PVC pipe mm. and just a PVC setup. So it was only like maybe $180. Mm. But I had maybe like five or ten. So I needed to figure out something to make all the money mm. to get that wheel because my parents weren't going to get it for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided that all my classmates at school always thought it was really cool when they saw me spinning on the spindle. And they all had seen it and knew about it, but they were like had no idea how to do that themselves. So I started offering lessons. And for a great deal, <laughs> uh, I let them take lessons for like maybe 30 bucks. And I sent them home with a spindle and uh -huh. a bundle of wool so they could keep practicing for themselves. And uh, I gave them like two hour lessons after school until I had made enough money to buy a spinning wheel. Wow. And then I stopped offering the lessons. Ah, once you got your spinning once wheel, I got the you spinning were done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, How old were didn't you? Need them all. Probably 10. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Good business. Yeah, uh, 10 or 11. Set up for that age. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, this spinning wheel is pretty cool. We could have a demo? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Let's go for the demo. <laughs> Thank you. 
so maybe I could tell a little bit about uh, how the spinning wheel works uh, during this demo. So I have the big wheel at the bottom and the little wheel at the top, and they work in a pulley system to spin at about a six to one ratio to make the bobbin turn really fast. So as you see, while the bottom wheel spins slowly, the top wheel spins really fast. And around there, around the bobbin, which is up here, there's a flyer. Which is a genius invention to make all the yarn wind up onto the bobbin. And the uh, yarn winds up onto the bobbin because the flyer is spinning faster than the bobbin because the bobbin has a brake belt on it. So with this system of pulleys and simple machines, you're able to make huge amounts of yarn very quickly. So what I figure is that in about four hours, I can spin eight ounces of wool. So it's about six to eight hours total per pound of wool. And a sweater like this contains approximately two pounds of wool to give an idea of how much uh, material goes into a setup like this. Since getting the spinning wheel, I haven't made it my business very much, but while I was living in Trinidad, Colorado, there wasn't very much work. So since I was looking for work, one of the things that I did is talk to my dog groomer about whether he had any access to uh, fiber. So he gave me the opportunity to transform hair from a dog that had just recently passed away into several beautiful skeins of yarn which I gave to him so that he can currently be knitting a vest to uh, commemorate his dog and keep it close to him. Wow. So what I did to make fiber out of dog hair, which is very short so very difficult to spin, is combine the dog hair with natural wool that I'd gotten from the stock show in Denver. And by combining that, I uh, was able to make really great fiber for him. So you, was it difficult to bring the hair of the dog with the... Uh... Yeah, so you have to have a really short, you have kind of the fiber length. So when you're pulling out the fibers, the fibers have a certain length to them. And you see here with the wool, they're pretty long fibers. But with dog hair, they're only maybe a quarter as short because it was shaved off of the dog, right? Mm -hmm. So there I had to blend it with, there I had to use a really short pull method. And if I pulled out a little too far, then I, uh, then the yarn broke and I had to reattach it and keep going. Wow. But it was a really successful project. I guess the, the owner of the dog must have been super happy to have this uh, sweater to commemorate his uh, love, love uh, Yeah, I love think one. it was really special for them when they got that. Yeah, it's crazy. So basically you could, you could just um, make your own yarn with any material that looks like a fiber. Yeah, so you can make it out of natural fibers or chemically processed plant fibers like bamboo and soy. So anything that has like any food that has fiber in it, wow. even banana peels, wow. can be turned into yarn. That's crazy. What's the craziest experiment you did about that? Um, so the silliest experiment anyway wasn't with um, the making my own fiber. 
the, there was definitely the stinging nettles for making fiber by myself, yeah. which was a crazy experiment. But one of my other experiments was that uh, to color the wool, they have to use a lot of chemicals, and those right. aren't great for the world, and they have to produce extra chemicals right. just specifically for dyeing wool. Wow. So what I did is made a big jug of Kool-Aid, Oh, yeah. Of super strong Kool-Aid <laughs> and dip the wool in that and it kept its color forever. Wow. So uh That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Very interesting. Sweet. Yeah. I uh could tell about another business I had. So I had a business called Spinning is Winning at oh, my yeah. mom's art gallery. Oh, really? I sold skeins for great deals too. What did you like sell? Skeins. Oh, this so, is a skein? Yeah, this is okay. a skein. So I sold cicanes and balls of yarn for like five to fifteen dollars. Wow! Which is a great deal in my in my current uh, picture of it. Wow! But we had a gallery on Santa Fe where we in uh, in uh, Denver. Yeah. Very cool. I'm uh, pretty sure you have a lot of very fun there's, stories. There's there's a lot of like really specific stories. Um. But one of my favorites was making my own loom out of wood. So I made a stand for my loom and I've always really enjoyed woodworking. So I uh, worked with my father to make like a stand for the like little Baker rigid heddle loom that I had. And then I worked to make my own rigid heddle looms out of like wire and PVC pipe. Mm. Yeah. So cool. Yep. So very handy. and. Uh one more question. How how do you feel like um, because for me weaving is also weaving connection in communities and bringing people together and you are at the very start of weaving actually because you just make the yarn but then what's your perspective on weaving the wool and how it brings people together? Uh, so I think that by, by uh, interconnecting the fibers and bringing all the different uh, art forms in the fiber arts world together that people can be brought a lot closer and uh, share share their space a lot and uh, I think that that's just real valuable. Wow it's really a uh, deep work it's not just spinning the wool it's it's really deeper than that I feel like. Yeah so if you have a skein And you twist it once, it becomes an infinity. Wow. Because yarn is forever. Wow. And spinning is winning. <laughs> I think that's the best uh, word for the end of the, the, yeah, cool. the conversation. And thank you so much for sharing all your inspiring stories uh, with me on yarn. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you showed me how to do it too, because you, you taught me a little bit how to do it super hard it's not so easy and what we saw you doing on the demo was seemed like so easy but it's not if we can compare how i do and how you do it's like amazing how skilled you are in making this yarn and, and very grateful for you to show me that yeah well thank, thank you, you so, so much for having me yeah how inspiring this story was um if you enjoyed this talk you can subscribe to this channel to receive the upcoming inspiring stories I'll share with you. And you can also click in the link in the description to make an appointment with me to discuss and see how I could help you activate your community to take care of people around you and the planet. And I'll be super happy to help anybody who, who has uh, such kind of projects because I can share a lot about how uh, to coordinate groups and reach your goals as a community so feel free to contact me and to get in touch with me by clicking on the link and making an appointment with me so we'll discuss during one hour um, your project it's free for the the last month of 2022 and i'll start some programs in 2023 to uh, support people who have uh, these kind of projects um, next year so yeah, I'm excited about this um, new adventure and feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm.